Good morning. How are you today? Who of us has not been caught up in the media of the past couple of weeks? The whole uh, issue around Black Lives Matter um, has caught our attention and has pulled at our heartstrings. I thought for our meditation today, I would like to read to you some words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who gave a lecture in 1966 at the height of the uh, civil unrest in the United States over segregation. I think these words form a really good meditation for our hearts this morning. And so here are these words of Dr. King. I would like to use as a subject this evening, the church remaining awake during a great revolution. I'm sure that each of you has read that arresting little story from the pen of Washington Irving entitled Rip Van Winkle. One thing that we usually remember about the story of Rip Van Winkle is that he slept 20 years. But there is another point in that story which is almost always overlooked. It is the sign on the inn of the little town of Hudson from which Rip went up into the mountains for his long sleep. When he went up, the sign had a picture of King George III of England. When he came down, the sign had a picture of George Washington, the first president of the United States. When Rip Van Winkle looked up at the picture of George Washington, he was amazed. He was completely lost. He knew not who he was. This incident reveals to us that the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that he slept 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountains, a revolution was taking place in the world that would alter the face of human history. Yet Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. One of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the new situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. And there can be no gainsaying of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our world today. We see it in other nations in the demise of colonialism. We see it in our own nation in the struggle against racial segregation and discrimination. And as we notice this struggle, we are aware of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our midst. Victor Hugo once said that there is nothing more powerful in all the world than an idea whose time has come. The idea whose time has come today is the idea of freedom and human dignity. And so all over the world, we see something of freedom explosion. And this reveals to us that we are in the midst of revolutionary times. An older order is passing away and a new order is coming into being. The great question is, what do we do when we find ourselves in such a period? Certainly the church has a great responsibility because when the church is true to its nature, it stands as a moral guardian of the community and of society. It has always been the role of the church to broaden horizons, to challenge the status quo, and to question and break mores if necessary. I'm sure that we all agree that the church has a major role to play in this period of social change. I would like to suggest some of the things that the church must continually do in order to remain awake through this revolution. First, 
we are challenged to instill within the people of our congregations a world perspective. The world in which we live is geographically one. Now, more and more, we are challenged to make it one in terms of brotherhood. Modern man, through his scientific genius, has been able to dwarf distance and place time in chains, and our jet planes have compressed into minutes distances that once took weeks and even months. Secondly, it is necessary for the church to reaffirm over and over again the essential immorality of racial segregation. Any church which affirms the morality of segregation is sleeping through the revolution. We may, must make it clear that segregation, whether it's in the public schools, in housing, or in recreational facilities, or in the church itself, is morally wrong and sinful. It is not only sociologically untenable or politically unsound or merely economically unwise, it is morally wrong and sinful. There are many insights in all of the major religious faiths which bring this out. Segregation is evil, to use the thinking of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, because it substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, segregation is wrong because it is based on human laws, which are out of harmony with the moral, the natural, the eternal laws of the universe. Paul Tillich, the great Protestant theologian who died some months ago, said that sin is separation. What is segregation but an affirmment of man's tragic estrangement, his terrible separation, his awful sinfulness? So over and over again, we must make it clear that we are through with this unjust system now, henceforth and forevermore. There is another thing that the church must do to remain awake. I think it is necessary to refute the idea that there are superior and inferior races. We must get rid of the notion once and for all that there are superior and inferior races. It is out of this notion that the whole doctrine of white supremacy came into being, and the church must take a stand through religious education and other channels to direct the popular mind at this point. For there are some people who still believe this strange doctrine. The next thing the church must do to remain awake through this revolution is to move out into the arena of social action. It is not enough for the church to work in the ideological realm and to clear up misguided ideas. To remain awake through this social revolution, the church must engage in strong action programs to get rid of the last vestiges of segregation and discrimination. It is necessary to get rid of one or two myths if we're really going to engage in this. One is the notion that legislation is not effective in bringing changes that we need in human relations. This argument says that you've got to change the heart in order to solve the problem. That you can't change the heart through legislation. They would say that you've got to do that through religion and education. But truly, it needs to be done through legislation, through our political leaders taking a critical stand at what is happening in society. A second myth that we must deal with is that of exaggerated progress. Certainly, we have made progress in race relations, and I think we can all glory that things are better today than they were 10 years ago or even three years ago. We should be proud of the steps we've made to rid our nation of this great evil of racial segregation and discrimination. On the other hand, 
we must realize the plant of freedom is only a bud and not yet a flower. The Negro is freer in 1966, but he is not yet free. The Negro knows more dignity today than he has known in any period of his history in this country, but he is not yet equal. There are still stubborn, difficult problems to deal with all over the country. I'm appalled that some people feel that the civil rights struggle is over because we have a 1964 civil rights bill with 10 titles and a voting rights bill. Over and over again, people ask, what else do you want? They feel that everything is all right. Well, then let them look around our big cities. I can mention one where we're working now, not to say that it's the worst city in the United States, but just to reveal the problem we face. Let me say in conclusion that I have not despaired of the future. I believe firmly that we can solve this problem. I know that there are still difficult days ahead and there are days of glorious opportunity. Our goal for America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson etched across the pages of history the words that I quoted from the Declaration of Independence, we were here. Before the beautiful words the Star Spangled Banner were written, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebearers labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters in the midst of the most oppressive and humiliating conditions. And yet, out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to grow and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery couldn't stop us, the opposition that we now face will surely fail. We're going to win our freedom because both the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of the Almighty God are embodied in our echoing demands. And we can sing, we shall overcome, because somehow we know that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We shall overcome because Carlyle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow keeping watch above his own. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood and speed up that day when all God's children all over our nation and the world will be able to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. And then we shall sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Those were the words of Martin Luther King Jr. in a speech which he gave in 1966. I read these words today because they do have an impact upon what we are facing today. Even though the situation is perhaps slightly different, segregation versus Black Lives Matter, it is the same issue though, isn't it? And I encourage you just to think about some of the comments that Dr. King has made um, in this uh, speech and think about how do they apply to our lives, and our attitudes today. Amen.